The U.S. military files a barrage of missiles at a Syrian air base in retaliation for this week's chemical weapons attack that killed 100 Syrian civilians. South African President Jacob Zuma faces a no-confidence vote as his waning popularity opens a rift in the ruling African National Congress and a stylish solution to the growing problem of urban air pollution. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Now, the U.S. military, on the order of President Donald Trump, fired a barrage of missiles into Syria early Friday in retaliation for a gruesome chemical weapons attack blamed on President Bashar al-Assad's forces that killed about 100 civilians. It is the first direct U.S. assault on Syrian government forces. Viewers Isabella Kokoli reports from Washington. Dozens of Tomahawk cruise missiles were launched from U.S. Navy destroyers in the Mediterranean in retaliation for the chemical weapons attack. American officials believe Syrian government aircraft launched on a rebel-held town with a nerve gas, possibly sarin. After the strike, President Donald Trump spoke to reporters at his retreat in southern Florida. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. It is in this vital national security interest of the United States to prevent and deter the spread and use of deadly chemical weapons. Trump called the chemical weapons attack this week very barbaric, saying Assad had choked out the lives of helpless men, women and children. He said years of previous attempts at changing Assad's behavior have all failed and failed very dramatically. Trump called on the international community to join the United States to end the carnage in Syria. I call on all civilized nations to join us in seeking to end the slaughter and bloodshed in Syria, and also to end terrorism of all kinds and all types. Syrian state TV called the U.S. strike an act of aggression. The strike came as Trump entertained Chinese President Xi Jinping at the Mar-a-Lago retreat. Trump did not announce the attacks in advance, although he and other national security officials ratcheted up their warnings to the Syrian government throughout the day Thursday. The surprise strike marked a striking reversal for the president who warned as a candidate against the U.S. getting pulled into the Syrian civil war, now in its seventh year. But the president appeared moved by the video and photos of children killed in that chemical attack, calling it a disgrace to humanity that crossed a lot of lines. Isabella Ciocioli, VOA News, Washington. U.S. military officials say 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles were launched about 4.40 a.m. local time from U.S. Navy destroyers deployed in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. For more details on the strike, let's go to the Pentagon, where viewers correspondent Carla Babb is standing by. Now, Carla, what more can you tell us about this military action taken by President Trump? Well, Vincent, U.S. military officials are giving us a lot of details about the strike. Uh, according to these officials, the strike was uh, was asked, We the, here at the Pentagon, they were asked for options on April the 5th. And on April the 6th, they presented those options. The president decided on the option to strike that airfield at about 4.30. And about four hours later, they started carrying out the strikes. Uh, early, early morning local Syria time to prevent casualties. We know that they were targeting aircraft. They hit about 20 Syrian aircraft while they were conducting the strikes. 59 total um, places where they targeted on that airfield. Other things were the hangars that had the aircraft. They also targeted some ammo storage facilities. But this was made in direct response to this chemical attack. This is a message from the United States telling the Syrians not to use chemical weapons against their own people. Now, perhaps a message to someone else. Uh, many are questioning why the Russians at that base in some way or fashion. 
Well, that's a great question, Vincent. And yes, there were Russians at that base. This base has been used in the past as a chemical weapons storage facility. Uh, there were Russians there, and the U.S. knew that there were Russians there, so they used a method of communication that has been used to deconflict airstrikes in the air to contact the Russians and say, hey, we're going to be doing this. We are just letting you know. So they avoided the areas of the base where Russians were known. And also on that on top of giving heads up was just an extra layer of protection to not get Russians involved in this. So then now, what next? What are you hearing? Well, that really depends on all of the players. Here at the Pentagon, you don't really know. Um, officials are telling me that this was a direct response, an appropriate proportional and effective response. They hit all of the targets, all of the 59 targets that they wanted to hit, and they have not been given further notification on additional strikes. What we don't know is how Syria and how Russia are going to respond to this. Russia has come out and said that this was an aggression. Syria has said that this is an aggression, but uh, U.S. troops are on the ground in Syria helping people to fight the Islamic State forces there. And so up until now, there has been this agreement between the Syrians and the United States, unofficial, yes, but there's been this agreement that they would not attack each other. This is now the first attack from the U.S. on the Syrian military. So now we have to worry, are U.S. Um, military personnel on the ground at risk since this airstrike has occurred? Well, but suddenly a change and a shift in uh, policy now towards that region. Uh, it is a shift in the policy, but it's just something that uh, the military says they saw the Syrian regime directly responsible. I've actually had officials that showed me the flight path of the Syrian aircraft as it left from this base and targeted that town near Idlib. This is something that is just different. There has been other chemical attacks, yes, but not this large, not since 2013. And so President Trump, who had just said last week through some of his UN officials that maybe removing Assad wasn't the top priority, now he has shifted. He has seen the pictures of those children that were mm -hmm. killed, and he says chemical weapons are not something that anybody needs to use against its people. And obviously, he says that the United States will get okay. involved if that happens. Well, we'll step on top of this story. Uh, Carlo, as always, excellent reporting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vincent. That's uh, VOA's Pentagon correspondent, Carla Babb, coming to us live from the Pentagon. Now, reaction from Syria and Russia to the U.S. airstrikes was swift. The office of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad described the strikes in a statement Friday as reckless and irresponsible. Russia, which is providing troops and air support to the Assad government, condemned the U.S. military action, calling it aggression against a sovereign state. Now, for more international reaction, let's go live to the United Nations, where uh, Margaret Bashir, VOA's UN correspondent, is standing by. Margaret, uh, a lot has been going on at the UN since this attack happened. Give us the latest. Right, the council's meeting as we speak. Vincent, the Russian uh, delegate, is speaking right now. He did indeed uh, repeat what the Kremlin said, calling it an act of aggression against a sovereign state. Uh, Russia very unhappy today with the United States. Um, we heard from Bolivia, one of the elected members of the Security Council, one of the 10 non-permanent members. Uh, Bolivia really forceful today. They are the ones who asked for this emergency meeting, and uh, their ambassador said that the United States has acted like the investigator, the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury in, on this chemical uh, weapons attack. He was irate because yesterday the council met until very late in the evening trying to decide on a resolution condemning the uh, gas attack of Tuesday and uh, there was a lot of negotiations going on around it and the council broke it around 8, around 8 p.m. New York time and then around uh, you know 10 or 15 minutes later is when the airstrikes actually happened so he sounded very uh, angry about that and he said that the United States was planning this attack even while they were basically pretending to negotiate in the council so Bolivia very upset there it's worth noting that they're often allied with Russia in the council in terms of ideology 
technology uh, on this. So very uh, testy meeting in the council right now, still going on. We have not yet heard from Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador. She's the president of the council, so protocol dictates that she'll speak last. And we know Ambassador Haley had said when the U.S. will act if others are not willing to act, does this strike in any way interfere with what will follow in the coming days in the, uh, in the deliberations there at the U.N. Security Council? Well, I think really the idea of a resolution might be dead right now. Uh, you know, the, the actions have overtaken what they were trying to do here. So we'll have to see what sort of appetite there is to try and do something in the council. But uh, some council members say that we still really need uh, an impartial, independent investigation into what happened. Uh, the Bolivian mentioned in his remarks that the fact that they had this airstrike may now color the results of, of an investigation. And so that was one of the reasons also that he was upset. Set. So we'll just have to wait and see how this plays out. But uh, also a lot of support for the U.S. coming from Western partners in the Council. The British, the French so far have spoken, uh, expressing strong support for this. The British ambassador saying that uh, President Assad's a war criminal who thinks gassing his people is a step to uh, stability. Well, sadly, we will be following up on this, Margaret. Thank you very much for your reporting. Uh, that's uh, VOA's UN uh, correspondent uh, Margaret Bashir reporting live from the United Nations. Now there is a new leader of the uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, investigating uh, investigations rather into Russia's interference in America's 2016 election. The embattled chairman of the House Intelligence Committee has stepped aside because of an ethics probe in connection to his unorthodox behavior last month in viewing classified documents at the White House and then briefing President Donald Trump about them. Now, viewer Steve Radish has details. California Republican Devin Nunez cited an ethics probe as the reason he is stepping aside from the House Intelligence Committee's investigation into Russia's influence on the 2016 election. Nunez's move is backed by House Speaker Paul Ryan. Uh, Chairman Nunez wants to make sure that this is not a distraction to a very important investigation, so he wants to go clear himself while this investigation continues on without any kinds of distractions. Yeah. The Intelligence Committee's ranking Democrat, Adam Schiff, says Nunez's decision was in the best interest of the investigation. Uh, it will, I think, allow us to have a, f a fresh start uh, moving forward. Nunez raised concerns from Democrats and some Republicans when he went to the White House last month, where a secret source provided classified material for him to review. He then briefed President Donald Trump about the contents, which Nunez said appears to improperly unmask the names of Trump campaign staffers who were incidentally heard during legal surveillance of Russian targets. Trump said the information Nunez provided somewhat vindicated his assertion on Twitter that former President Barack Obama had his wires tapped at Trump Tower. However, the country's top intelligence officials have said there is no evidence to support Trump's claims. Nunez faces an investigation by the House Ethics Committee to determine if he improperly disclosed classified information by talking about the material he received. A trio of Republican lawmakers will now take charge of the House Russia probe while the Senate pursues its own Russia investigation. Steve Reddish, VOA News, Washington. On to Africa now, Rwanda started the 23rd annual commemoration of the 1994 genocide on Friday. The United Nations named April 7th as the day of remembrance of the victims of the genocide. The nation is remembering an estimated close to 1 million Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed during four months of a horrendous massacre. The National Commemoration Week, known as Kibuka 23, marks the beginning of the 100-day genocide memorial period. The genocide began on April the 7th. 1994 and was stopped on July the 4th by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Now for more on the Rwandan genocide anniversary, reporter Hamada Rassam joins me on the phone from Kigali. Now Hamada, first uh, if you can briefly just tell us what uh, has been taking place today. Uh, today the morning started early in the morning uh, at 7 at the Kigali uh, Memorial Site, uh, Gisozi. Uh, the president and the first lady, uh, officials of the country, ministers and diplomats attended, some uh, religious leaders as well. Uh, the president uh, lighted a, a flame 
uh, to bring light, uh, as he mentioned. Uh, and then uh, almost uh, everybody who was attending was dressed in gray or black uh, as a sign of warning. All the shops here in the city were closed. And then at 5.30, uh, there, uh, there was a walk led by the president himself uh, from the parliament to uh, the stadium. Uh, around 2,000 mm -hmm. uh, attended in this uh, march, and then uh, more uh, than 30,000 were waiting at the stadium uh, for the okay. president's arrival. Amada, we know that this genocide took place uh, now. It's been over 20 years. So many of those who attended, uh, who, who, who survived uh, older, but there are so many other young people who never even witnessed this genocide. What are you hearing from them? What are they telling you? You've been talking to, to a number of them. Uh, actually, uh, the president uh, today uh, emphasized uh, on the role of the youth uh, for leading the future of this country. Also, they, ha they have been thinking of uh, what happened to their families, and uh, they, live in, uh, they live with people who have lost uh, their relatives. Uh, maybe they didn't get affected directly as those who have been through the genocide, uh, but they are getting affected in a way or another. Also, they feel the same fear and the same division that have been uh, uh, existing uh, since the genocide. And uh, they, we know that uh, the events just begin, but they will end months from now. So we will keep uh, on top of this. We'll, uh, thank you very much for your reporting. And we hope to catch up with you again. Thank you so much. Okay, that's Amalda El Rassam reporting from Kigali in Rwanda. Now, South Africa's political tensions were on full display Friday as thousands of protesters gathered in major cities to demand that President Jacob Zuma resign. Thousands more rallied in support of the president who faces a no-confidence vote in parliament later this month. Viewers Anita Powell reports from Johannesburg. Thousands of voices raised against one man. Across South Africa, citizens took to the streets Friday to demand the resignation of President Jacob Zuma. Protesters say the African National Congress, party credited with ending apartheid, is corrupt and no longer serves them. It's not about race. It's about the country now. ANC liberated us, but they, they can't lead us now. It's not about uh, now we must be stuck with ANC when they're doing wrong. No, we can't. But Zuma still has many supporters. Corruption scandals have dented his popularity and prompted widespread calls for his resignation. However, here, outside ANC headquarters, the party goes on. Zuma supporter Patricia Maluzzi took an overnight bus from the city of Bloemfontein to show her support. I came all the way here to fight for what my late brothers and sisters fight fought for. I mean, Zuma is not the best president ever, but yet again I say people do make mistakes. And who am I to judge? Where did we get power? If we let him go right now, we're going to have to struggle again to start from the bottom to get the power. So I basically came here to fight for what my brothers and sisters died for. The opposition Democratic Alliance has spearheaded a no-confidence vote in Parliament on April 18th. Other opposition parties say they will vote against Zuma, but the ANC says it will stand by him. Some ordinary South Africans say they're staying well out of the fray, with many businesses in central Johannesburg closing for the day. Nurse Aubrey Machuele says he opposes Zuma, but steers away from protests as he frowns at how they sometimes turn violent. He says he longs for the ANC of Nelson Mandela, the nation's first black president. They knew how to do things at that time. This is not the same ANC that we know now, compared to the ANC that we knew before. The protest drew South Africans from all walks of life, some of whom had never protested before. First-time protester Jenny Min says her message for the president is simple. Goodbye. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. And find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, could this chic bench help you breathe easier in a big city? We'll be right back, so stay with us. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines.
In Gambia, the longtime opposition party wins an absolute majority in parliamentary elections, defeating the party of ousted leader Yaya Jame. In West Africa, regional governments are working to boost their naval capacity and improve cooperation to put an end to piracy and drug trafficking. In South Africa, thousands march demanding the resignation of President Jacob Zuma after his firing of the popular finance minister. In Somalia, hundreds continue to arrive at the Al Adala camp for displaced people in Mogadishu as effects of an ongoing drought worsen. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation is holding its flagship event on good governance in Morocco this weekend. Africa 54's Esther Gidu Yuwat is closely following the event. Esther. That's right, Vincent. The three-day conference is underway and among the issues being discussed is migration, violent extremism and economic development. And joining us live via Skype from Marrakesh is Salo Hatang. He is the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Good evening, Mr. Hatang. Good evening and thank you very much, Esther. Let's start with the core issue. I know you're discussing so many of these issues that are pertinent to the African continent, but let's start with one of the horrifying one about migration of Africans to Europe. They are dying in their thousands trying to seek refuge in Europe. What seems to be the root cause of these problems and is the conference discussing possible solutions? I think that's one of the key questions that needs to be dealt with. Um, because uh, the, the, one of the key things that we tend not to deal with is why would Africans choose to leave their countries to go elsewhere? And most of the time it's, uh, what, uh, it's young people that then want to leave. It must be that uh, uh, one of the issues that we have to address is the issue of alienation. People feel alienated, uh, less uh, opportunities that they have in their countries, uh, and therefore they believe that if they, if they go elsewhere, uh, they might get a better life. The result, of course, is that uh, you then have Africans who feel further alienated when they get to those countries. Um, but it's not only just the, the migrating to Europe. Inter-Africa migration also leads to violent reaction. And uh, I come from South Africa, where you'd know that uh, recently we've had uh, violent reaction towards non-nationals, particularly of African descent. So you then have... Um, an issue where we have to go back to issues of governance. That's why the more Ibrahim uh, governance weekend is important because it's saying let's focus back to leadership, issues of leadership, creation of opportunities for young people so that they can thrive in their own, own countries. But that good governance must be uh, uh, encouraged in our countries. But Mr. Hatang, when you talk about, let's discuss this, critics say such conferences happen all the time. But they are out of the conferences, there are no practical solutions that people see implemented within the next few months. What does the conference propose to do in a situation like this? One of the things that uh, has been really positive with the Mo Ibrahim uh, Governance Weekend is that you have uh, uh, Mo Ibrahim, who is an influencer himself, who tends to take these issues back to governments. Um, so that's why it's important that you don't just create a talk shop where uh, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation then takes up issues that can change policies in countries. All right. Um, Let, uh -huh. and, 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 and you have uh, also uh, former presidents, for example, most of, most of the people who are involved here is leaders themselves. You don't just have people who are talking heads, but people who then can take some of these issues and take them back to country for implementation in terms of policy changes. Okay, let's move on to the issue of violent extremism. And I'm thinking about the case of Somalia and Nigeria. What really are you focusing on here? The root cause of this extremism and how it's spreading across Africa and also the solutions to this problem. One of the things that has been noted by the report is that um, extremism has become a, a market on its own. And when you have young people who are de desperate for opportunities, anything that comes their way, they will grab. And I think uh, until such time that you make that option um, not so suitable for them, 
it, it will keep being a problem. You have people who leave their countries just to be extremists in other countries uh, because uh, uh, the market in terms of the arms industry and also just the uh, violence that uh, violent eruptions in, in different countries tends to then be uh, very marketable. Okay. And I think uh, uh -huh. until such time that we change that, we make uh, it uh, not such a lucrative industry. Um, uh -huh. We will then be able to change uh, uh, the, the environment. Mr. Hatang, as you discussed the good governance and strengthening uh, African leadership, we look at situations like uh, the Central African Republic area wh where, you know, there are crises going on, there's political repression. Also, I'm thinking about the economic development you're discussing there. What should Africans expect to come out of this conference that can practically be seen to improve the economic development of various countries and even and uh, take care of the youth that are largely unemployed briefly three three things uh, three things i think are important that will come out of this one is that the uh, uh, the governance weekend produces a report which is then shared uh, uh, through the continent and the world two is that the uh, policy changes will be proposed to, to countries um, that can then shift uh, how uh, particularly young people are treated in those countries three is the emphasis on participation in economic development by young people. And I think until such time that we recognize that, uh, and the report also states that uh, we have a, a, a continent that's very young, and uh, we must then make sure that the opportunities are not only created by, by, for young people, but that they fully participate in creating those opportunities. And that's what this weekend will help achieve. Any discussions at all, Mr. Hatang, on the crisis, the drought and the famine facing the Horn of Africa? Yes, that will be a point of focus. Uh, climate change, as you know, is a big issue. And in fact, uh, people have lost more lives out of climate change than they have out of violent eruptions in, in, in countries. And I think it's important that uh, we then address climate change. Uh, denying that climate change affects particularly the developing uh, world is something that it needs to be fought against, and uh, I think uh, that's something that we'll focus on. Um, All right, Mr. Hatang. You, you remember that in South Africa Thank we've you. had uh, such issues ourselves. Thank you. We'll follow up with you, Mr. Hatang. Thank you very much. Selo Hatang is the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. It might not look like much, but this smart piece of urban furniture is creating a clean air bubble around it. Created by London-based company Air Labs, this clean air bench is fitted with air cleaning units that filter harmful pollutants. Air is drawn in through the back, trapping particles in a filtration system before gas pollutants are absorbed. Clean air is then dispensed from under the uh, armrest and several other grills. Now, the bench was created to showcase the technology, but the idea the units can be fitted to everything from benches to lampposts, bus bar shelters, and city walls. And that is what is trending today, and that is our show. Good night. To English in a minute. An alley is a narrow path between or behind buildings. Up one's alley. Does this expression have to do with city streets? Jonathan, do you have any friends who teach singing? Um, hello. I am a singer. You are? Oh, awesome. Do you...